connects academics of, yeah, sorry, academics sorry. with policymakers. And so she, this project was born as out of um, um, demands of, from, of, from the Ministry of Trade of, of, of Uganda. They wanted to learn more about small, firm manufacturing, small firms in the manufacturing sector. And so Ritika really had a more kind of the institutional role and now she's doing a PhD at Northwestern. And then she kind of joined the team and then me and Tommaso are, uh, Tomas is at Columbia, is in a faculty at Columbia. Uh, we came in kind of more with the idea and the, and the, um, yeah, and then the, the analysis and, and the writing. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a team effort. Uh, everybody had a bit of a, yeah, you might say a bit specialized role uh, in, in putting this together. But yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, but it would have been, I think, impossible to do this without, you know, everyone here was, was uh, equally fundamental in getting this together, so. Yeah. Uh, good. Thanks very much for that. Yeah. Right, it's, so, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. With that, um, hello everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to welcome Vittorio Bassi from University of Southern California. Vittorio is an assistant professor of economics at the uh, economics department and is a lead academic for IGC Uganda. Yeah, you can go that way. His research expertise is in development economics and labor economics, and uh, his work on in unemployment in particular is, is very exciting. Today, however, he'll be talking about how rental markets can help small firms achieve scale efficiencies when, especially when capital goods are, uh, have lumpy investment, right? So Vittorio, you have one hour and 15 minutes. The mic is yours. Thank you very much, Tusha, and um, very happy to be here. Thanks for the, for the invitation. So I've already introduced the team, uh, and so I'll, I'm just just gonna jump right in. And so this paper is gonna be about the role of uh, firm scale uh, for uh, development. And so the premise to our work are, are gonna be three key facts uh, about firms in developing countries. Now, the first is that uh, firms are typically small. The second is that there are many of them. And the third is that this, many firms operate side by side in informal clusters. So we can see this also in the case of Uganda, that's the setting of our study. So here we use data from the census of business establishments uh, from Uganda and every dot in this picture is a, is a sector. And so on the X axis, we have the average firm size in the sector. And on the Y axis, we have a measure of uh, firm density. So we take each firm in the census, we draw a circle around it of 500 meter radius and we count how many other firms there are in that radius uh, of the same sector. And so we see that as you can see, most firms operate in sectors where the average firm size is small. So most firms are around here, but also where there are many other firms located nearby. So for example, in carpentry, the average firm has four employees, but there are within 500 meter radius of a carpenter, there are usually at a, another 20 carpenters producing nearby. So what, I'm gonna, what we're gonna show in this paper is that these tricky facts are gonna be important for understanding the drivers of how how small firms in developing countries adopt uh, uh, technology. We're gonna focus on one specific aspect of technology and that's the fact that technology comes often embodied in very large and indivisible capital inputs. So if you think about a firm that wants to upgrade its capital stock, uh, sometimes they need to, they can only do that by, by kind of starting to use a, a large machine. And so we're gonna show that these, these three key facts matter. And the first fact, as I said, is that first firms are small. And so by themselves, firms might just not have sufficient scale really to justify investing in these large and indivisible capital equipment. And so basically the indivisibility of capital might hinder, you might say adoption and productivity at the firm level. However, as, as I've shown you, production in developing countries takes place in, in informal clusters where there are many firms operating side by side. And so while it's true that it's e each individual firm by itself might be too small to adopt this large capital equipment, the cluster as a whole might have enough scale to make the investment uh, worthwhile. And so really the key insight that we're going to leverage here is that while it's true that production machines are indivisible, the capacity or the time that the machine is used can be shared among many firms. And so what we're gonna show is that in fact, we're gonna uncover that small firms uh, are gonna, as we say in the title, achieve scale collectively. So what we mean by that is that we're gonna show that machines are shared through a very active, rental market between small firms and that this rental market is going to allow firms to mechanize and to increase uh, their productivity. So to, to give a bit more detail on what uh, how the paper is structured, we, we, I'm going to start by presenting a novel survey of over a thousand manufacturing firms that we conducted 
in urban uh, Uganda. And this is going to be focused on three sectors that employ a large share of workers in manufacturing. These are going to be carpentry, metal fabrication, and grain milling. And the key innovation of our survey, as I'll describe, is that we document the entire production process for a number of key products. So we're going to have information on each single, every single machine used uh, by the firm, plus a, a lot of other information. And so we're going to first use this data to describe the organizational production in these sectors with a focus on how small firms adopt technology embodied in machines. And so I'm going to use data on every on each individual machine to show that to make the case that we find large economies of scale in this context, driven by the large capacity and cost of these uh, large uh, machines. And then I'm going to spend some time describing the existence and the functioning of a very active rental market that these firms have basically put together between themselves uh, that allows them to access uh, this, uh, this capital equipment. And the way it works is that one firm in the cluster manages to buy, is a slightly larger firm manages to buy these machines, but these machines are too big for them anyway. And so they're gonna rent out the excess capacity that they have to other firms in the cluster. They go, come to this firm, use the machine and pay a price to use it. And so, however, in doing that, there's gonna, there are gonna be transaction costs the firm have to incur because you know, firms are gonna have to travel to the machine, wait to use the machine. So we're gonna document and, 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 uh, and quantify these, uh, these transaction costs then in the rental market. And then we're gonna write down a model of technology adoption and machine rentals that allows for the presence of these transaction costs in the rental market through, that we model through uh, wedges. And we're going to first of all use it to understand the aggregate implications of the rental market. So, to what extent the rental market enables firms to achieve, as this way, as we say, scale collectively. So, to what extent it enables productivity and mechanization. And the key finding is that these transaction costs, while they're present, they're actually fairly limited. And so, we're going to show that the rental, a very simple institute, a very simple rental market here, is going to achieve, is going to increase by quite a large amount productivity and mechan mechanization relative to a counterfactual where there is no possibility of renting. And in fact, we're gonna get quite close to a first best where, where the transaction cost is, is zero. So the rental market, the key conclusion, the rental market is quite effective. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you the distributional effects. So which firms gain and how much and why. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about what these results then imply for how we think about the importance of rental markets more broadly. And we're gonna do this by studying how the, the relevance of the rental market depends on the characteristics of the economy. And we're gonna show that in this context, the rental market is so important because it mitigates other imperfections, other market imperfections that keep firms small. So firms are struggling to grow in this environment because of labor market frictions, financial frictions, frictions in the demand market. And so through the rental market, effectively the rental market, it's almost like mitigates or undoes some of these other frictions because it allows even firms that have to remain small because of other constraints to, uh, to, 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 achieve, to, to uh, adopt this, uh, this technology. And because we think that these, friction, these kinds of frictions are more prevalent in developing countries, then we're gonna argue that the rental market is gonna be more relevant and, uh, in developing countries rather than uh, in other contexts. Then in terms of the contribution, we are going to contribute to three uh, literatures in development economics. So first, there is a, there is a large and important literature on, the, of, on fixed costs and the uh, potential for these fixed costs to create poverty traps. And so here, a contribution is to show that, again, a simple arrangement like, a, like, a, like the rental market that I'll describe allows small entrepreneurs to escape potentially poverty traps by, by making something that is indivisible like a large machine, effectively divisible uh, uh, through, uh, through, different, through many firms. And then this is also related to a literature on entrepreneurship and financial frictions that, sh that shows that financial frictions uh, create misallocation, reduce investment, and effectively limit growth. And so really our key, our key contribution is on, on this over this literature is to show that the rental market effectively reduces capital misallocation. So the rental market almost functions like the financial the, the financial sector here, it redistributes capital from firms that have low cost of capital but low returns to using that capital, they're gonna buy the machines, to firms that have high returns to using the machine but also high cost of capital. And these are gonna be my firms that rent the machine. And so effectively the rental market is a workaround to financial frictions. Um, and finally, I'm gonna show you some implications for what we do for uh, the firm size distribution. So of course there is a large literature studying 
the firm size distribution, how it's dominated by very small firms and the implications that this can have for uh, productivity. And so we are going to show that I'm going to show you that once we start looking at, at, at the at the firms at the firm size distribution through the lens of the rental market, then effectively, in some way, firms are going to be larger than we think through these firm to firm interactions. And so we're going to show that if effectively, uh, yeah, uh, there are there are going to be a, a, a bit more larger firms than uh, than we think uh, in developing countries. And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll clarify exactly how how we do this exercise. And but finally, there, of course, there is, there is there, yeah, please. Yeah. Can I make a quick comment? So there's a much older literature, uh, Nicholas Stern and Christopher Bliss, who have talked about the same argument in the context of agriculture, that how, you know, when the tractors come in, uh, they obviously are lumpy investments and how re a rental market helps. So perhaps, you know, a, a, a reference to that would be nice. But also one of the things that they point out is when you have these rental markets, the risk of have, making these investments gets transferred from you know, the person who's using it to the person who's actually buying it, right? And that has lo uh, you know, large implications for you know, how the economy works and the efficiency. So perhaps some you know, touching on that will also be no. a good idea maybe. No, this is great, uh, Tushas, yeah, thanks a lot. So yeah, I, I, as I was about to say on the last bullet point, we're not the only ones to, we're not the first and not the only ones actually even right now to talk about uh, uh, rental markets. In agriculture, as you say, there has been a, a large literature looking at, for example, as you say, the adoption of uh, tractors and so on. What I think is different here is the idea that really say these are, you know, small firms that 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 set up a rental market between each other. What I think what we've seen more in other contexts is some external enterprise or someone com coming in and start renting out like tractors to to farmers. Here instead, it's really, it's, it's like the individual entrepreneurs that, that, that set this up. By themselves now, but but this is very, uh, of course, very uh, very related. The role of risk is very important. We are not going to tackle that, and one of the reasons is so the cost of capital is going to play an important role, but the risk is is um, is not going to play a role here. And I think the fact the reason is that um, we we're going to have a cross section, and so it's you know it's a little we we want to stay a little bit away from these kinds of you know insurance and potential for shocks and and how the rental market might help with that which by the way we think it's it's very important so that's definitely a, an interesting extension in fact i mean the next step that we want to do here is to build a panel and then to start studying for example some of those considerations how risk and uh, and uncertainty and the possibility of shocks to your productivity over time might might feed into uh, the rental market being a relevant arrangement, an important arrangement, and also the relevance of the rental market related to that over the life cycle of firms as firms kind of gain uh, productivity over time, for example, knowledge and so on, and accumulate capital. So all of those kind of dynamics and risk is going to be kind of not uh, not for today, but it, it's something very relevant, absolutely. Uh, Vittorio? One, one more slightly different question, um, and that is um, in in many markets like this. Uh, you might have a dominant firm um, and you have a relationship between the dominant firm and the other small firms that would go beyond things like the leasing of capital um, and include a, a dependence for intermediate inputs to be supplied. Uh, so, and it seems to me that that relationship is quite important. Um, and it, it survives in East Asia all the way through, uh, you know, Japan through the 1970s. So, um, so, and I'm wondering, are you, are you going to account for a possible interdependency through intermediate markets in this analysis? Yeah, no, this is great. So, uh, thanks a lot. I'm going to show you that in this context, the rental market is actually quite, operates in a way that is quite competitive because there, are, there is enough of these firms that own machines so that we don't really seem to have these kinds of dependent relationships. Mm -hmm. So, it's going to be more like a spot rental market and not where we don't really see much evidence of like relational contracts. It's a very, very simple arrangement driven by the fact that there are enough of these uh, machines. Now, mm -hmm. you're raising, of course, there's also a very important point here that again, is something I'm not gonna touch upon today, but um, of course, a related question is where the firms access the intermediates. And in some cases, uh, firms are gonna access intermediates in, in uh, not from the, th these firms are all doing exactly the same, the same products. And so they don't buy intermediates from each other. This is very horizontal. They're completely kind of, the relationship is completely horizontal here. However, of course, they, sometimes, you know, the machine owner might be located in a part of town, which is also convenient because the firm go is going to buy timber 
the carpenter is going to buy timber uh, from from a market nearby. So there's going to be kind of a potentially a complementarity in, in in that sense that some machine owners close to where the inputs are located or the key market where the inputs are bought uh, might gain some advantage because of that. So again, but we're not going to look at that, even though it's a relevant uh, dimension. And the main reason is that because we find that overall the market seems to be quite quite competitive. But but in other contexts, that's been of course as you say. Has been documented, and and, and it, the, ex ante there was no reason to expect that uh, we, sh we would have found something so close to a competitive market, and it could have been much more relational. I'm going to talk about the labor market that actually is a lot more uh, frictional. It appears to be here, and 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 um, the relationships are more, uh, um, yeah. There's a lot more frictions there, so I'll talk a little bit about this uh, as we go. Vittorio, can I yeah. have a quick yeah, comment here? So if you have so many firms that are small in size, so they couldn't afford the uh, you know expensive capital, so then there's a burst of this uh, rental market to help them um, spread the risk or you know whatever. But I also think you, you mentioned about this uh, transaction cost to go into rent those um, capitals. I also see that as a uh, incentive to for mergers. So small firms can yes. merge together. So I, I don't know, I'm not sure if I'm asking a question too far, but I'm thinking that, you know, I'm not sure if you're going to touch on whether, if you have the scenario where you have many small firms and a couple with a small rental market compared to a case where these small firms been merged and then they can own their machines in terms of the welfare, mm -hmm. I mean, which I, I can see both sides yeah. has pros and cons. Um, but I don't know if if uh, if you can touch on that yeah. or yeah. No, this is super important. So yes, I think it's a great question, and, and it's like in a way like a, a little bit of a million dollar question. We we don't see firms merging. We ask firms, would you ever consider like buying a machine together or merging together? And they just say no. We would never do it. And I think we don't know exactly why. It's a little bit beyond the scope of our project. But I think the main constraint here is going to be some contracting friction. So if you merge, you know you have to decide how we're going to split the profits, who is going to who is going to pay if the machine breaks down, and uh, you know all these other things. Instead, right now the arrangement is the arrangement is very simple. Every firm is independent; they just interact through a very simple spot rental market. The machine owner pays the machine; is responsible 100% for the machine, and so there is complete division of responsibilities. And the the only interaction is through a very very simple mechanism that I'll show you. It's just a very very simple spot rental market. Uh, but I think that's uh, that's a very potentially yeah it's 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 a very interesting question. And however, you know the, the fact that the transaction cost is going to turn out to be relatively small, in a way, tells us that in, from a production efficiency point of view, we're not so far from uh, from a situation where firms are effectively consolidated. Mm -hmm. And that also motivates a little bit kind of our exercise looking at the firm size distribution uh, under a different light, which we will do later. Uh, but I think, you know, again, I think that's a super important question and, and something that we can't do, but it would be really great to start to learn more, you know, because it might have, again, important implications for formalization, for example, access to access to export markets and so on, where you really need to have one entity that is large. And, and that just doesn't happen here. Yeah, um, so maybe that could be a different paper, like you might want to look yeah. at why the merger doesn't happen in this case. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. okay, so great. Let me... Let me then start telling you about the first part of the paper that is, uh, that is about the survey. So we uh, conducted a survey in a representative sample of urban areas of three of the four regions of Uganda. You can see them here. And um, the urban areas are highlighted in blue. And so uh, we went into each of these urban areas, which are called sub-counties, and we conducted a full listing of every firm. And we did this door to door, every firm operating in our three sectors. And then we sampled from this listing we took a random sample of about a thousand firms for the survey. In terms of the survey design, the key innovation is that we collect detailed information on the product, entire production process for key products. So we spent some time kind of pre-specifying for each sector, and this I'm gonna show you here for just example for carpentry, one key product that should be made by, by most firms. For example, in carpentry, it's a, it's a specific type of door that you see here. This is something that pretty much most carpenters should, should make. And then we broke down again, and we pre-specified, we broke down the entire production process for these products into a series of steps that again, most firms should typically engage in. And then for each firm, we know that if they produce the product, the product and if they engage in each of these production steps. And then for each step, we collect detailed information on the exact combination of capital and labor 
that the firm uses in production. And in particular, we know if the production step is mechanized. So what we mean by mechanization is that we know uh, is that these production steps can most, most of them can be done in two ways, either using a modern kind of electrical powered machine like the thickness planer here. This is the thickness, thicknessing step in carpentry, or they can be done with a corresponding manual tool and more labor, like here you have a manual plane. So we know if the firm, for example, is doing uh, thicknessing through the thickness planer or the manual planer, and if they, if they use the thickness planer, we know if they are renting it or, or if they own it, and we know how many hours they use the thickness planer in addition to the price that they pay if they rent it or the price that they pay if, if they own it. And in particular, I want to stress we are going to have measures of how many hours firms use the machine, which is going to be important. Then, with this data, I'm going to now show you some descriptives on the organization of production in Uganda. I'm going to first show you what we call kind of descriptives on the anatomy of production, really how production happens both within the firm and across the firm in terms of which, which products firms make, which production steps they engage in, and how they make them. And then I'm going to kind of zoom in to uh, the role of mechanization for productivity, the role of firm scale for mechanization and the functioning of the rental market. And here really the objective of this part is going to be to produce a number of statistics that are gonna be, I think in some sense, interesting by themselves, but also are gonna effectively inform and discipline our model. We're gonna create some moments that then we're gonna target in the model. And then at the end of this section, I wanna show you some, again, implications of our results on the existence of the rental market for how we can look at the firm size distribution. And that's gonna, again, I think be kind of thought provoking, but also help motivate uh, our model. So on the, I'm gonna go a little fast on the first part, the anatomy of production, because this is simple in a sense. We are, again, we confirm, the, the first point is that we confirm with our data, what we saw in the first slide, that there are many firms operating side by side in informal clusters. That's true also in our sectors, in our survey. The average carpenter, for example, has four employees, but the average carpenter has 26 other carpentry firms within 500 meters. So if you, if you think about the scale of the cluster, it's, it's much larger than the scale of the firm. We find that firms produce similar products and in carpentry, really, most firms will produce beds and doors. And again, door was our, our pre-specified product and firms also follow very similar production steps. Uh, we have you know, all of these in the paper. So effectively we don't find something that again, example that we might have expected to find, which is specialization either across products or across production steps. We don't see that. These firms are all kind of small copies of each other. They all produce similar products using similar production steps. They don't do outsourcing. Uh, they don't specialize really neither across products or across production steps. And this is important because it creates the possibility that these firms might share capital because they, they need similar machines uh, because they produce similar products using similar steps. So in principle, they could share the same, the same machines. However, we shouldn't think, and this is critical, we shouldn't think that, that these firms are all the same. They produce similar products, but they are different. So uh, there is some heterogeneity in size of the firm. So for example, again, the average carpenter has four employees, but we have about 5% of the carpenters that have more than 10 employees and uh, this is the 20 to 80 percent, uh, percentile range. And you know there is variation. Also, when you look at measures of revenues per worker or profit per worker, there is variation. Some firms are more productive. And we also measure a lot of you know, education of the manager, other characteristics, and there is a heterogeneity. So these firms are producing similar products using similar steps, but, are, but they are heterogeneous in, in, in dimensions that might be relevant for who is gonna potentially, for example, buy the machine. Okay, then now here, I'm gonna, I would like to dive a little bit into uh, the role of scale and, uh, and mechanization in production. And here I'm gonna, what I'm gonna talk about now applies to the carpentry sector. And, and then I'm gonna come back to the other sectors at the end of the section. Now, the reason is that the carpentry sector is the sector where we find these relationships to be most uh, stark because of just of features of the production process and, and the size of the machines. But I'll, I'll come back to the other sectors at the end of this part. So I'm gonna present four facts here about, about mechanization and scale in, in carpentry. And again, these are all gonna, all the relationships that we're gonna see here, they were gonna target as moments in, in the model. Now, the first point that we make is that mechanization is important for uh, productivity. Now, there's a number of ways in which we show that, but one kind of the most basic way is to just get a measure if you look at just, for example, column one or column four of revenues or revenues per worker of the firm and regress that on a measure of mechanization of the production process. So how do we create that measure? We pre-specified we pre 23 types of machines the firms can use to produce doors. And then we asked the firm, 
if they use each of these 23 machines and then we can just take the ratio of this, the share of these 23 machines that they use and that it's, it's going to be our measure of the mechanization rate of the firm. And so what we find, for example, is that going from no mechanization, so doing everything by hand and with manual tools to using all of the possible sophisticated machines that you can use, uh, revenues and revenues per worker is more than double. Now, of course, this is not causal, but it produces a correlation that we're going to, uh, that, that we're going to target in, uh, in, in the model. Of course, again, mechanization is not the only thing that matters. We have detailed measures of the manager quality that we collected by running a survey uh, really using similar questions to the standard management surveys of Bloom and Barina that have been adapted to developing countries by uh, Chris Woodruff and David McKenzie. And so here again, we find that managerial quality really matters for productivity and controlling for managerial quality still doesn't diminish that much the effect of mechanization. So at least we can say, even though these, these results are not causal, that the relationship between mechanization and productivity doesn't just capture the fact that higher ability managers are better able to use machines. And we also show in the paper that, uh, that, that these gains in revenue productivity are coming both from more efficient production, meaning physical productivity uh, um, enhancement through um, machines allowing you to do something faster, but also there are quality improvements. So the output made with the, the products made with machines are gonna be with, uh, higher quality and we measure quality directly uh, in the survey. Now, the second fact is, I think, a bit more uh, interesting, and that's that we find that scale is a limiting factor for investment in machines. So how do we show that? We, we find that with our data on machine prices and machine utilization, we find that machines are expensive relative to the profits that these firms make. So the thickness planer that I showed you before, which is a key, key machine in the production process for carpentry, costs 18 months of profits. So by, you know, by any standard, I think this, this is a very large investment that a firm would have to make. And, um, but however, you know, even conditional using one, even the firms that do use these thickness planes, they use it for about 20 hours per week. And these firms are open 60 hours per week on average. So the machine is idle two thirds of the time from, from a firm perspective. So if you put these two, two things together, um, then kind of the natural consequence of this is that if we look at the investment rate, so if we look at the um, investment in these machines, we're gonna find that there is low investment. So here we show, before we had the mechanization rate, here we create a similar measure, which is the investment rate, which is the share of the 23 machines that you own, that the firm owns. And here, here we report the CDF. And what we see is that there is almost half of the firm. So this is 0 0.4 here. Almost half of the firms have zero, they own zero machines, okay? So almost half of the carpenters in Uganda own no machines, okay, for, for producing a door. But there is some answers, some, some firms do. And if you look at who owns these machines, is the relatively larger firms that own the machines. So here we're gonna show the firm size distribution, the CDF of firm size, by whether you own machines, and that's the black line, and whether you don't own machines, and that's the dotted line. And so what we see is that as expected, it's gonna be the relatively larger firms. Uh, we can we could do this with firm size, we could do this with managerial ability, some measure of scale. We find that it's the relatively larger firms that actually buy the machine. So if you put these two facts together, then you might be, you might be concerned that in fact, we are in a situation where small firms might be prevented from mechanizing by their small size. And so there might be, all, there might be big mechanization productivity uh, losses. Uh, Vittorio, can I have a, a quick question here? Yes. Uh, is in terms of the output, does it make any difference if you use it uh, manual planner or compared to the machine planner in terms of the output? In terms of quality, it, yeah, it quality does. or whatever, yeah. So, so which one is better? You. So if you look at the last column here, we are going to regress the mechanization rate. We're going to regress the qual a quality index of the door, which we measured by direct observation. So we had the numerators assess the quality of each door produced by these firms by taking measurements, see if the, if the door is straight, if, how thick is the door, and so we regress that on mechanization, and we see that there is a big uh, going from no machines to using all the machines increases by by um, by more than 1.4 standard deviations. So it's, it's, a, it's a large effect. Is it this particular product that you chose that ten, turns out the machine has a higher quality than the manual production or it's a general pattern? Because you know, so I know we, some, some products right. like they prefer to be handmade compared to machine made. I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great, great. Uh, so that's a good point. Um, we can't speak to that because we only have one product. Um, but but given that, so 
given the type of product here, some of the operations are going to be very hard to do by uh, by hand. So like the planing, like it's going to be very hard to have, uh, you know, play, like uh, to, to have the piece of wood that is going to be really straight and really, uh, so some, some of the activities might be done by hand, like the final touching or the final, you know, but, but the key, the key steps like cutting, planing, those are just going to be much harder and much slower done by and lower quality done by done, done by hand but but you're right this this doesn't have to apply all so in this this is definitely the case that in this context in this in, for these products mechanization really matters but but in other contexts it might uh, it might might matter less yeah okay um so so we're in a situation where we, we think there might be this reduction in productivity and investment because of the small size of the firm and the large size of the machines but however we find that there is an active rental market so let me show you just how the extent of the rental market. So this is again our CDF of the investment rate. So we have about 40% of the firms that own zero machines. But if you look at the CDF of utilization rate, the machine utilization rate, you see that it's only about less than 10% of the firms that use zero machines, right? And the difference between these two CDFs is the rental market. So almost everybody uses machines, but but only half of the firms own the machines. That's the idea. And the difference is the, is the rental market. So how does the rental market work? I'm gonna talk more about that in a couple of slides, but just to give you a sense, is between firms in the same sector, and it's the machine, uh, and, and our machine owners that rent out the excess capacity to other firms uh, nearby. So we can show, we can show the extent of that kind of reallocation of machine time. Because if you take each machine, um, a firm, each firm uses a machine for about 20 hours per week, but each machine is used by the market, so by potentially more than one firm, for 35 hours per week. So capacity utilization almost doubles thanks to the rental market. And we measure this directly, so this is not imputed. This, we, we ask for each machine owner how many hours the machine is used by themselves and how many hours the machine is used by other firms. And that's how we compute, uh, compute these numbers. Do you have firms that own the machine, but also rent it out for other firms to use? Absolutely, yes, 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 yeah, absolutely. So, so we have two types of, so, okay. So the majority of cases, firms that own machines also rent out part of the time of their machine to other firms. We also have cases, and we are going to uh, allow for that in the model, of firms that buy machines and use their machine very little for themselves and mostly just rent it out. That's also possible. And we're gonna allow for that in the model. Um, so, so that's related to what Tuja's comment early on that you, that's a way to diversify your risk of owning the machine, right? You rent it out. You can yep. own it, but you also can rent it out. So we are going to argue, yeah. So the argument that we have is it's not really about, it's not going to be about risk. It's going to be about scale. It's going to be the fact that even the relatively larger firms are still too small to use the machine all the time. And so they need to rent out the rental, some of the machine time to make it worthwhile for them to invest. You could see it another way. You could see it that some of the excess capacity, it might be volatile. It might be that sometimes I need it, sometimes I don't need it. And when I don't need it, I rent it out. And that ensures me, like Tusha was saying, which is a great point. But we just, with a cross-section, it's just hard to see those fluctuations. We, we, we can't, we, we don't know. We have just a, just a snapshot. So for that, we think with a panel, then you could start seeing whether in, periods when the firm is having low productivity, then they can rent out the machine, right? As insurance, that, that kind of right volatility in demand is something that, or, and in, in those kinds of productivity shocks, we, we can't really observe in the data, but I, I, that would be a great next kind of almost- Peter, obvious, can I have a quick question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, hi, hi. Uh, so it'd be very interesting to see if you, if you can make you know, a, a similar graph uh, where on the x-axis you have investment rate and on the why you you show uh, you show market share, you, you see where I'm going with this because yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to understand here is why wouldn't a firm which has a high rate of investment or high investment rate, as you're saying, um, not crowd out the small players? Great. Now that's a great point, and I'm going to argue, and we have some evidence that that doesn't happen because there are frictions in the demand. So. If you think we're going to show the output is very the output market is very segmented for two reasons. Now um, there are frictions, so uh, firms see, see. have troubles kind of advertising and uh, and and getting customers coming from from further away. But also firms produce slightly differentiated products, so these doors are not all the same, right? And so and so both kind of differentiation in products and 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 demand and frictions in the demand market are gonna 
are going to make it hard for firms to grow. And so that, and so because of that, it's going to make it hard for firms to steal the demand of other firms. So because of that, firms are going to be willing to rent out their machines because this is not going to hurt their profits through increased competition very much, again, because the output market is segmented. But one counterfactual that we're going to do at the end is to say, okay, if we reduce these frictions in the demand side, what would that, what would that predict? And what would okay. that predict is that there are going to be this, this, the firms that own machines that are productive, they're going to grow and crowd out other firms. And so the rental market is going to disappear. So that's, again, why I was saying that we think these kinds of arrangements are more plausible and sustainable in settings plugged plugged by other imperfections like demand frictions or labor market frictions. As soon as firms can grow on their own, mm. we would expect that to happen and, and the rental market to disappear. Um, can, I, can, can I just follow up on that though? I mean, I, I find this a little bit far-fetched. I mean, when you, you had the spatial density of firms um, earlier, has it been extremely high, right? The number of other yeah. firms within what is it, 500 meters or whatever you said is, is really quite high. Um, and, uh, the, there really is a question here as to why these firms do not consolidate. I know it goes all the way back to Simon's point earlier as well, um, but uh, um, that they are located in a, uh, in a very close to one another. Uh, they're going to have high shipment and marketing cost, uh, yes. and both presumably a fixed cost as well. Right? Um, it's not as though, I mean, I can imagine a situation where you have different population groups um, who demand this product and who have a tendency then to demand from the local producer, right? So the one that's in their village or whatever. Um, but but these guys are all very closely located. Right? And so if you want to buy a gore, uh, you go into, into this zone and you have, you know, 50 firms within a small radius. Um, and uh, but the question is, um, you know, whose marketing do you listen to or how, how do you actually go about that purchase? Yeah, no, I think that's great. It's a great part. We, we don't know. Um, so we look at behavior, they rent out machines. And so it, 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 this, by review preference, it means that by doing this, this, that this increases their profits from renting out more than it decreases through their profits to increase competition. So that, we're just looking at the data for that. Now, of course, so we are in the survey, firms say that it's hard to reach out to different, to new customers because of uh, marketing, you know, uh, difficulties and also a lot of, Kind of social networks in purchases. So firms tend to receive customers from through word of mouth or uh, kind of customers that refer other customers, and so it's kind of hard to to steal demand. But I think, to be completely honest, I think our data is a little limited on, on what we know about the demand. It would be much interesting to, and I think this is an important area for future research to really understand um, how demand uh, works and, and and what are the sources of these frictions in the demand side that that we argue are there and we show some evidence of, and, and they would justify the, the, the kind of sustainability of a rental market. But, but yeah, I, I think it would be very, uh, yeah, very I, interesting. I, I, I think these uh, uh, questions about the demand side of the market are very important. And so, I mean, perhaps as said before, it's the subject of a, of a complementary paper, but I think it's essential to understand that. It might be that the production of doors is a rather special case, but you've extended your study into metal work as well. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll tell you a bit about those sectors. But but some of these issues on on uh, difficulties in, in getting more customers and and uh, increasing demand, uh, they 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 don't seem to vary uh, across sectors that much. Right. Okay. Um, Vittorio, can but I we don't a, fully know why. Yeah. yeah. Can I make a quick yeah, suggestion sure. here? That so basically, yeah. if you go back to the agricultural literature, you have the same problem, right? The small farms are not consolidating when there mm -hmm. are benefits yeah. from doing that, right? They're not they're not even specializing. And one of the reasons that the literature talks about is the, the value of being you know, a landowner or the value of being, so these are mostly subsistence farmers and there's a value in you know, just being a landowner versus working for someone else. So maybe that's a way in yes. which you can explain it using the supply side, right? Uh, you don't get to the demand side in that story, right? But also uh, in terms of you know, what Rod was saying, right? So you could actually, since you have data on a couple of, different uh, products, you could actually separate them out into say uh, industries which have high demand fluctuation and low demand fluctuation, right? And do a simple heterogeneity analysis, right? And you should find that there should be more specialization where the, the demand is more stable, right? Yeah, so this is, this we can, um, 
we, I mean, in each sector, we only have one product that we collect information about, and the sectors are going to be different in many dimensions, as, mm -hmm. as I'll show you. And so, again, it would be very interesting to do. And in fact, I mean, if we collect more data, something we want to do is to collect data for multiple products. Okay. So we could exploit potentially some of these uh, heterogeneity also in how, in how customizable the products are and how substitutable um, uh, the products are. And, um, and so, so absolutely, First, but again, it's gonna be for future uh, work. Now on the first point on the agriculture, uh, that's, I think that's, that's, um, that's potentially a very interesting reason why firms might not consolidate it because everybody sort of wants to be their own boss and there is a value in having, right? In, in, in being an entrepreneur here. And so again, those preferences and so on might, might really explain some of this. Um, but again, we don't know much about that, but it, it would be very interesting yeah. to, to understand. Can I, can I offer just a point on that? I mean uh, one of the important things in agriculture is the nature of property rights over land. Right? So that if, if you do consolidate that somebody else is cultivating, the law may not support your property rights over that land. The, the, now absolutely. that may also apply in, in villages in Uganda. Right? So if, if you own uh, enough land to put a shed on to produce uh, wood products, um, it may well be that the property rights um, over that property are, are difficult for someone else to acquire because of the yeah. nature of the law and the uh, uh, and the defense of property rights in Uganda. I may be wrong, but it, is that no, 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 this is no, no, I think I think you're right. I think, you know, property rights are going to have a lot to do here also with the and, and, the, and, and the difficulties of enforcing contracts for why firms are not getting together. They're not they're not buying. For example, we never see machines bought jointly. That just never happens. And again, enforcement of contracts might, might have a lot to do with that. Uh, okay, so the, the, the one more thing I want to say here is then through the rental market, we see that the firms that manage to, it's, it's, the, through the rental market, we see that it's this relatively smaller firms that manage to mechanize. So here again, we have the CDF of firm size by whether you own the machine and that's the dark line and then by whether you rent machines and but you don't own them and that's the dotted line and then by whether you just don't use machines and so you see that it's through the rental market it's the relatively smaller firms that manage to mechanize but of course there are going to be some firms that are very very small and very unproductive and so they still don't benefit from mechanizing even with the with the rental market and so they just decide to do everything uh, with labor and that's the the the, the, dark, the, the lighter line and so effectively the call through the rental market the correlation between size and mechanization becomes lower than the correlation between size and investment. You don't need to be large to mechanize. You need to be large to buy the machine. And that's really the, how the rental market enables firms to overcome this indivisibility. Now, um, in terms of, we document that, uh, however, so this is the function of the rental market, but we document that there are, there are significant transaction costs in this rental market. So what, these arise really from a very kind of, um, uh, simple type of cost. And it's the fact that if you want to use a machine, you have to travel to where the machine is located. And so there's going to be a travel time. There's going to be a waiting time that sometimes you have to, uh, to wait to use the machine because we also document the firms all want to use the machine at the same time. So there's going to be congestion in the morning where people want to use the machine and there are going to be transportation costs. So we measure these costs directly and we show that they're actually sizable, they're relevant. However, we also show that these rental markets, even though they're subject to these transaction costs, they do operate uh, competitively. And, and again, we have discussion in the paper, but, but the simple reason, one, one key marker of this is the fact that there are enough of these machine owners so that we don't create these kind of, uh, you know, um, firms, uh, we don't really create monopoly. We don't seem to have evidence of monopoly power of, of machine owners over, uh, over machine renters. And we do a number of checks uh, for this. So one, one now one key parameter that is going to be playing a key role in the model is going to be and in general for us for understanding the efficiency of the rental market is going to be this the role of transaction costs we're going to call these tau and so now i'm going to tell you how we try to measure these and quantify these more directly other than just say that there are kind of time and transportation costs we try to put a number onto this so the way we do it is to is to think that to realize effectively that the presence of a transaction cost if you're a renter the presence of a transaction cost effectively increases your marginal cost of capital. Because assuming that there is a price, machine, an equilibrium rental price of a machine that is we can call PR, if you are a renter and every time you wanna use a machine, you have to pay a transaction cost, which is this time and transportation cost. We can model that as a, as a tau uh, and so as, as an iceberg cost that we have here. And so this is effectively, this is gonna raise the marginal cost of, of using one more time the machine one more hour of machine time. Instead, if you're a machine owner, 
the marginal cost of capital for you is just going to be the rental market price PR because your choice as a machine owner is going to be, do I use the extra hour of machine time for myself or do I rent out the extra hour of machine time? If I rent it out, I can rent it out at price PR. And so effectively my marginal cost of capital is going to be the opportunity cost of renting out one more hour of my machine. There's no so the, commodity taxes here. There's no tax wedge between purchase price and uh, uh, buyer's price here. PR so, does indeed uh, uh, equal the, uh, the same thing. So there is no taxes or any, there is, so, okay, this is important. The, this, in, this economy is completely informal in the sense that there is absolutely no written contract. There is absolutely no tax. There is absolutely no requirements of any side, type. The, the way you should have in mind is somebody shows up at a firm and pays like 3,000 shillings, 4,000 shillings cash just to use the machine for 20 minutes and then leaves. And there is no record of any transaction. It's, it's completely informal. So what we're capturing here is the idea that the renter, in addition to paying those 4,000 shillings, has to pay another 2,000 shillings of a bus ticket to go to use the machine. That's really as simple as that. That's kind of what we're saying. It's that transaction cost. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, no, but that's it's important to try that. Now, yeah. Yeah, can I ask a question about the cost here? So one yeah. question is uh, who is really operating these machines? Uh, mm -hmm. Is the owner or the, the renter? Great, great, great. Uh, yeah, the second question is when you calculate the marginal cost, uh, markup, I'm sorry, the markup, uh, just uh, uh, do you take into account this tau or just the PR into the cost? Okay, so in terms of the um, who operates the machine, it's, it varies. Uh, in about half the cases, it's actually the machine, is an employee of the machine owner that either uses the machine directly for the renter or at least supervises what's going on. Because of course there is a moral hazard issue here and there is the, the machine owner wants to avoid the machine breaks. Now, we think of that as being passed uh, through in terms of the rental market price, PR. So that's gonna feature, those monitoring costs are gonna be in the PR, they're not gonna be in the TAO. The TAO, we really think of the physical transportation costs. So when we, whenever we think about the revenues or, or, or uh, over cost, for example, of the, of the markup, we're gonna think of PR over the price of the machine. So TAO is really just a, just a pure kind of a physical transportation plus potentially capturing some other things, but, but conceptually that's how we think about it. Uh, a quick question. Uh, yeah. I'm just curious. So I understand you have this, uh, you know, transportation costs. Uh, do you note any kind of a, um, a inertia with the, the suppliers, for example? Is there any uh, form of a switching cost uh, that you observe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, it's hard to know that. Uh, we don't measure that directly, but what we measure is um, we ask manager, like we ask machine owners, who do you rent your machine out to? Is it only people that you know, or even just people that show up at your door? And they say, I rent it out to whoever shows up. Even people that I don't know, even people, because it's such a simple mechanism. And so the switching cost is gonna be very limited here. You know, oh, you can no, go to that, another firm. Oh, but that would, be, that would be finding customers. My question is, do yeah. the customers have some sort of, you know, fixed investment in finding a uh, no. supplier? No, we don't think, we ask them if search costs are an issue in the rental market and they say, no, we know where the machines are. This, that's what's interesting about this market. It's so simple. The machines are also visible because you can see them from the street. These firms are producing on the roadside. You can see the big thickness plane. You know who has it. And I'm going to talk about the difference with the labor market, but that's very different. With the labor market, we have a lot of those issues, lack of trust, lack of search frictions that create the, the labor market friction. But the, the rental market is very, very simple here. So, uh, but again, it, it didn't have to be. We, we, we document that it's like that. But as you say, it could have been, it could have been more complicated. We could have been more, you know, some of those issues might have played a role. So, all right. So we'll hold on to our questions till the end now, because uh, I think the is that, Let me, that's, that's, that's okay. I'll, um, let me make a little bit more progress, but but I think we I should be uh, I should be um, uh, ready to take some more questions also as we go. Um, but let me now yeah let me go through this. Uh, the um, a very any kind of cost minimization problem. What that's going to do, uh, you know, a firm in a static cost minimization problem is going to set the ratio of the marginal products of capital and labor equal to the ratio of the marginal cost of capital and labor. And so then because 
a capital, uh, a capital renter faces a, a relatively higher marginal cost of capital because of the rental market wedge. Then effectively, what this means is that if you look at the capital rate labor expenditure ratio of a renter, it's gonna be lower relative to that of an owner. So what that means is that because on the margin, somebody that rents capital has to pay the rental market wedge, that means that that, that renter we use relatively more labor and relatively less capital because capital is relatively more expensive compared to a capital owner who doesn't have to pay the rental market wedge. So the capital labor expenditure ratio of a renter will be relatively lower than the capital labor ratio of, an, of a machine owner. And so we use that intuition, which comes direct, just directly from a simple cost minimization problem to run a regression where for each production, so if you remember the production steps that we had like thickness in planning, for each of those production steps, we can, in a firm J, we can calculate the capital labor ratio used in that production step. So I know how many, what I can calculate is how many hours of capital you use and the price that you pay, how many hours of labor you use and the price that you pay. And so we can create the left-hand side, which is the capital labor ratio in one production step, J in a firm, uh, S in a firm J. And then we can check whether that's lower, the capital labor ratio is lower for firms that rent machines versus owning machines. So we can regress in that production, the capital labor ratio in a production step, on whether the machines used in that production steps are owned versus rented. That's a dummy for, that's a, just the share of the machines that are rented versus owned. And then we can have a step fixed effects like thicknessing, planning, thickness effects, effect, fixed effects, sub county fixed effects, firm controls. But what is nice here, and so what we would expect is a negative beta one if there are transaction costs, because that would mean that a machine renter will use relatively less capital compared to labor when you compare it to a machine owner because capital is relatively more expensive for them. What is nice here is that we can include firm fixed effects because we have data at the production step level S within firm J. So the comparison is going to be between two production steps in the same firm where one production step uses rented machines and one production steps uses, uses owned machines. And we wanna see whether the capital labor ratio in the production step where you rent machines is lower than the capital liberation in the production step where you own machines, controlling for step fixed effects. And so we can show that here in the first column and we find the negative coefficient. This is telling you that even within the firm, steps where we're using machines that are rented have a relatively lower capital liberation. So from this, using the simple kind of formula that we had before, we can back out the size of the rental market wedge tau, which turns out to be 0 0.4. So that means that for every dollar that you spend in the rental market, you have to pay 40 cents of transaction costs. And that will distort your capital liberation accordingly. And now we can do a back of the envelope calculation where we go to our survey and we say, okay, how much do firms spend on bus tickets to go and rent a machine? How many hours do they wait? How, many, how much time do, do those trips take? We price all that time, we sum it all up. And when we find that that can explain about 60% of this wedge. So again, we, we think this number 0 0.4 is actually quite reasonable. And, and it's, our, it's gonna be our measure of, uh, uh, transaction cost, then it's going to come into uh, into the model. Okay, so so now we have identified like a key parameter that is going to that is going to come back. It's going to be delivered by uh, by the model. And so, what where do we stand now? Before I move to the model, we we have uncovered the presence of a rental market that potentially solves an issue of unexploited economies of scale. But this rental market is frictional, so there are transaction costs. So the key next step, and that's going to be the second part of the paper, is really to understand how uh, effective is the rental market at helping firms achieve scale and so at helping firms mechanize. Um, and so how do we show that? First, I'm just going to show you a simple exercise that shows the, uh, the extent of the rental market by, um, um, by, seeing, by, by showing what that implies for the firm size distribution. And then I'm going to actually use the model to try and quantify to what extent the rental market wedge prevents, the transaction costs prevent the effectiveness uh, of the rental market. So this is usually, you know, in terms of looking at the, what our results really imply for the firm size distribution, you, we are usually, we, we are used to thinking of a firm as, as, a work, as a collection of workers working under the supervision of a manager. Now, if we do that, that's the standard definition of a fir of firm size. If we do that we, and we plot the uh, resulting CDF here of the firm size, we see that this is, we see something that is very standard. The average firm size is small. The median firm size is five employees. And there's only about 5% of firms that have more than, more than 10 employees. However, we've shown that firms share machines to the rental market. 
And so what we, an exercise that we can do is to do the following. We consolidate all the firms that share the same machines and we treat them as one. So we redefine a firm as a machine and all the workers that use that machine. If we do that, then we, this is the new firm size distribution. And the share of workers and the share of firms with more than 10 employees goes from 5% to 33%. So we start to see some of these kind of middle and large firms. Now, of course, this is just a thought exercise, but, but what this, mean, this illustrates the extent to which, if you want, the rental market allows firms to share machines and to, and to get together. Of course, this is not a quantification of the extent to which the rental market enables uh, firms to achieve scale. So for that, we want to estimate the model and want to uh, um, uh, quantify a, a, a quantify effect to quantify the aggregate implications of the rental market uh, transaction cost in reducing mechanization uh, and productivity. So um, let me just now jump uh, quickly. I'm just give you, gonna give you the model in one slide. Just before I do that, uh, let me just say that all the results that we, all the assumptions that we make in the model are going to be tied into the empirical evidence. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, model uh, the cost of labor as increasing uh, with firm size. So we're gonna uh, uh, model, we're gonna show, well, we're gonna model labor market frictions in the labor market. And that's tied to our evidence about the labor market that appears to be highly frictional because of screening and search costs and other similar costs and other similar labor market frictions. And also we're going to, and we talked already about this, we're gonna model the output market as being perfectly competitive because of our evidence about limited competition and, and frictions in the, in the, uh, in the uh, demand market, in the output market. Just a word on the other two sectors, we find that the extent to which the rental market is prevalent is much lower in the other sectors, but we have an explanation for that that is very in line with, with everything we're doing. Effectively, the rental market exists also in welding and grimly, it's just less prevalent. And the reason is that scale really appears to be a much less of a limiting factor in these other sectors. In metal fabrication, the machines are just very cheap because of the nature of the machines. Just a welding machine, it just costs maybe $200. It doesn't cost $4,000, so it costs... And in grain milling, machines are used more intense. Machines are expensive in grain milling as much as in carpentry. But in grain milling, you only really need one machine or two machines maximum. And so basically every firm buys one of these machines and use them, uses them at capacity. Instead in carpentry, we are really in a situation where you need many different machines for the different production processes. And each of these machines just, there is a, they're all imported from China and Germany and they're all very large. So th th these differences in, in, in really the features of the production process help explain uh, the differences here. So if there is, I think if there is a burning question or two, I'm happy to take them now before just uh, showing you a little bit about the model and, and the results. So I'll ask a quick one. So from the data that you showed us that the owners of the machines were using it for 35 hours or so, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in total, right? And they have it for 60 hours in a week. So clearly from that market's not competitive in any way, right? I mean, you could have sold as many hours as possible otherwise. Yeah. Uh, and also you said that there's some level of, you know, monopolistic comp competition that every, every machine owner uh, caters to a few people, right? So you have on both sides, you have like a non, it's not a perfect competition in any way, right? The output market could be, but this exchange market is not, right? So the, 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 the rental market appears to be more, com more clo closer to a competitive market than the output market. I think that that's mm -hmm. something that we find strong evidence for. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's fundamental because it's very important because again, because of the frictions in the output market, firms, them, that's gonna make it difficult for firms to grow on their own. But then what so about the trend? What about the 20 hours that they're keeping the machine idle? Right. right. So, so that, uh, yeah. that uh, so that's, we don't know. So one, the way we're gonna model that, and it's gonna be important is we're gonna think of a convex cost of capacity utilization. Mm. So of course you don't wanna run the machine at capacity, right? I mean, because it's the, the risk of breaking it and the risk of it is completely like having a failure is gonna be higher if you run it all the time at capacity. So that's how we think about it. Uh, okay. But we don't have a direct explanation for why they, you know, that, that rational, we use that, that, that rationalizes the behavior, but we don't have a, um, a direct evidence on why, why we don't run it more. Uh, there could be some limits to demand um, or, yeah. or some convex cost, yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, one, but, one minor point. Sorry, 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 would, it be, would it be better, I'm just thinking about the way you characterize a model like this and how you model it. I mean, I see this as a model uh, of, uh, an industry with multi-product firms who uh, sell planing and cutting services uh, mm -hmm. to other firms, 
uh, who use those services, right? So that in some sense, you, no. you can model these firms that have the machines as, as multi-product firms, serving two different types yes. of demand, final demand and intermediate demand by other firms. And then you have firms who are just doing final demand work. Right? So that, that's one point. The other is that, that your characterization of the transport cost here as being a bus ticket, I, I just don't think that's right. If you're doing metal work and you're doing uh, timber work, you're not going to put all the timber that's required to produce doors on a bus. I mean, these guys have to have a truck and maybe they lease that too. I, I don't know. They, um, but yeah, the truck is required. So they don't have a truck. In fact, in most cases, they really literally go. And that's also why we model the transportation cost as, so this transaction cost has been like an iceberg cost because the way it works is that they jump on a motorcycle taxi with a big piece of wood on, yeah. like hanging it, and they just go. And then they have to take multiple trips because they can't afford the truck. So it's really, it's really, it, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Now, the second point of the, your first point, I think, is very relevant. We could see everything I'm saying. You could see it as firms outsourcing some of their uh, uh, intermediate steps, and but but in a sense, everything still goes through. Uh, it's just another way. For, it's almost like a way of relabeling the, what we mean by the rental market here. Right. Uh, but, but so let me let me just quickly give you the idea again. In the interest of time, I'll just do it with one quick slide, and I, I want to show you in the last ten minutes some of the results. So how do we think about just the model? I'm going to give you the intuition here. We're going to think of managers as being heterogeneous in their productivity, right? So their managerial quality Z. Managers decide to enter the rental enter the and produce as carpenters or or take an outside option that we will estimate. If they enter, they draw a cost of capital row. So each manager is going to be defined by a couple now, which is the managerial quality and the cost of capital. And then each manager makes two choices. They decide whether to mechanize the production process, so to use the thickness plane or not. And this choice is going to depend on the managerial quality because we higher ability managers want to be larger. And so they want to scale up using machines because scaling up using labor is very expensive because there is this uh, friction in the labor market, which we document is, is substantial. It depends, of course, on the relative productivity of the mechanized process relative to the labor only process, which we captured with a parameter AM. And then on the strength of the labor market frictions, the stronger the labor market frictions, the more you want to mechanize the production process because it's, 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 it's going to be costly to scale up using labor. The other choice the managers have to make, but that's a separate choice in the model, is the choice to buy a machine, which depends on your cost of capital, the prices in, of the machine, of the rental market, and, and, and the size of the transaction uh, cost. So managers then, of course, can be partitioned then in different groups. There's going to be managers that buy machines, managers that use machines to the rental market, and managers that not, don't, just don't use machines, and so they only use uh, labor. And then there are going to be some intensive mar mar margin choices of capacity utilization, as we were saying with Tusha. Firms are going to decide how many hours to use. There is this convex cost of capacity utilization that makes sure we don't want to hit the, the, the top. And then there's going to be kind of a cop Douglas production function. Everything else is quite standard in terms of combining capital and labor. And the market that's going to be in equilibrium is the, is the rental market. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit uh, about that. And also the output market uh, is going to be in equilibrium. These are the two markets that are in equilibrium. So there's going to be a market clearing um, rental market price PR. And so now let me- um, So Victoria, yeah. can, just uh, to clarify here, just uh, you assume a uniform productivity uh, for firms. So this productivity apply to all the steps in the production. So there's no heterogeneity in productivity in each step. There's a, not within step, no, or across steps. Okay. There is just, just overall, some managers who just have a higher managerial ability and so they're more productive throughout. So okay. they, yeah, we, we thought about going there, but then in the end we decided to take it, you know, to, to step back. And so the, the production steps are useful for measurement, but in the end in the model, we abstract from that. So we're gonna think of only one step. Now, in the interest of time, let me, I have a couple of graphs here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this through because I do wanna give you the, um, I'm going to give you the, the results. So let me give you now, let me talk a little bit about the, just the key proposition that we have about the model. And um, for, the, for why the rent, so, and the proposition is going to be about the role of the transaction cost in affecting the equilibrium here, in affecting mechanization and, and productivity. So what we can show uh, for a fixed set of managers, so shutting down entry and, and fixing the output market, what we can show is that a decrease in the transaction cost, tau, what that's going to do, so if we think of, if we bring down the transaction cost now, what that's going to do to the market is going to have lead, uh, yield higher profits for all managers, 
in the model. Now, why is that? Because there's going to be higher demand for the rental market because you know the transaction cost is lower, so there is high demand, which increases the, the the price, the equilibrium price. So machine owners are going to be better off. But also, the, the increase in the rental market price is not enough to uh, offset the decrease in the transaction cost now. And so that means that also renters are better off because even though the prices are going up, the transaction cost is going down. And so even renters are better off. So everybody's better off from the reduction of in the rental market wedge Dow. And because of that, there's also gonna be a higher engagement in the capital market with lower transaction costs. Both owning and renting goes up. Capital is more valuable for everyone. So machine owners have a higher incentive to buy, machine renters have a higher incentive to, to keep on renting, expanding how much they rent. So these effects are driven by two forces. And this is really the key, the key function of the rental market. If we reduce the rental market wedge Dow, the transaction cost, this is going to have an effect which is very similar to the financial market. It's going to improve the allocation of capital. Because what that means is that the correlation between, because of, with a low rental market wedge, the correlation between mechanization investment is going to decrease. There are going to be some firms that have low cost of capital, they're going to buy the machine and they're going to rent it out to firms that have high cost of capital, but high productivity and high returns from using the machines. So we can a lower rental market wedge effectively plays the role of, of, the, of the financial market. But it's not just that. So the rental market doesn't just play the role of the financial market in, in decoupling investment and mechanization. It also plays, it, there is also a scale effect, and this is really the achieving scale collectively idea. We have a, we have, we show in the proposition that even if you fix everybody to have the same interest rate, so there cannot be kind of reallocation by definition uh, to firms that have higher low interest rate because everybody has the same interest rate. We still show the average mechanization increases if you lower the transaction cost. And that's because, again, because there is more demand. So higher, with, lo with lower transaction cost, there is more demand for capital. And so machine owners have an incentive to buy more machines uh, because now they can rent out the excess capacity through the rental market. And so that's gonna push them to buy more and it's gonna make it easier for smaller firms to buy, to use the machine through the rental market. And so effectively there's a scale effect there is this, this achieving scale collective idea that through the rental market, small firms manage to mechanize. There is over and above just the, the more standard kind of financial market effect of reallocating capital between firms that have high cost of capital and low cost of capital. So, so this is not just really about the financial market. The rental market plays two roles, financial market and, and giving firms the possibility of scaling. Um, so let me, in the last six minutes, let me just then quickly show you the key results from this part and from the model. I'm going to be like super fast on how we take this to the data. Um, we already have one key parameter. That's the transaction cost tau. We have that. So that's going to be uh, already estimated. A number of parameters, we estimate them from, we have them from the data. We calibrate them. We know the machine prices, PB. We know the rental market prices. And some we're going to estimate by stimulated method moments by targeting all the, and these are going to be all the, some of the relationships that I showed you before, plus some other, uh, a number of other moments. And we have a long discussion in the paper about about identification, but let, let, me, let me skip that. So it's gonna be simulated method of moments for, for the remaining uh, parameters. There is one that I wanna highlight here actually, because I need this uh, to show the key result. And that's, I wanna highlight one thing that comes out of the estimation that is very important. And that's this last number here. That's gonna be the correlation between the interest rate and the productivity. We actually find negative correlation. So what we find is that higher ability managers, managers that have higher productivity, these are the managers that have the highest returns from mechanizing because they're the larger ones. They also have lower cost of capital. So they have easier access to capital. We validate that, by the way, with a number of questions about can you rent, can you, would you be able to, to, to borrow and so on. And this is important because this is telling us that the allocative role of the rental market, in fact, is, lim is gonna be limited because the, the high ability managers are, already have low cost of capital. So, right, and so this is gonna be important for the result that, that I'm gonna show you. Now, in the last five minutes, let me show you the key results. So, how do we, so what are we doing here again? Why do we need a model? We need the model to quantify to what extent the rental market enables mechanization and productivity. So how, how or seen another way, to what extent the transaction costs prevent the, the efficiency of, of the rental market, enabling firms to mechanize and, and increase productivity. So how do we show that? Well, we can estimate the model forcing the transaction cost tau to be infinite. If it's, inf if it's infinite, we're shutting down the rental market here. And then we estimate the model with different values of the transaction cost tau until we go to transaction cost of zero. So this is the fully frictionless rental market. 
So going from no rental market to a fully frictionless rental market increases mechanization by over 160%. So these are the potential gains from a fully functional rental market relative to no rental market. And this is the gains in productivity that are 16%, okay? Going from no rental market where firms can only use a machine if they buy it to fully frictionless rental market. Now the key question, so these are the potential gains of the rental market estimated from the model. Now the key question is where are we in this, in this, uh, you know, in this, in this x-axis? Where is our rental market wedge? So rental market wedge is here. That's 0 0.4, right? That's the wedge that we estimated. So what, for example, looking at mechanization, what we what we see is that we go. Where, where, what is our economy? Our economy goes most of the way there towards the efficient, uh, uh, the efficient uh, gain, the gains that you would have under efficient rental markets. So effectively, and, and the same in productivity, we get about half of the benefit, half of the possible gains already achieved through the rental market. So one way to look at this, and that's kind of how we prefer to look at this, is to say that in fact the rental market is quite effective, right? Of course, there are transaction costs, but but we go quite a long way towards the efficient uh, allocation. Now, and then this is the final slide before I conclude. And really, why does really here we can see the essence of why the rental market produces these benefits. There are really two forces. One is the scale effect and one is the financial market effect. So let me start from the scale effect. This is in the absence of the, of the rental market, we're gonna show that we have a correlation here between managerial ability and mechanization. Of course, the high, even in the absence of the rental market, the high ability managers are the ones that want to mechanize because they have the highest returns from mechanizing. So they will buy the machine, even if there is no rental market. On the, on the right side here, what we see is, the, is the, on the x-axis, the interest rate, and on the y-axis, the mechanization, uh, the percentage of managers that mechanize. And here you see that firms, in the absence of a rental market, firms that have a high cost of capital just cannot mechanize because they, they would have to buy the machine, but they have a high cost of capital, so they can't do it. So what the rental market does, starting from the left figure, the rental market effectively increases mechanization for everyone. So this is the scale effect, right? Everybody mechanizes more. It's, this is a fully frictionless rental market. Both the high ability managers mechanize more. And that's because now they have, through the rental market, they can rent out the excess capacity, which gives them an incentive to buy. And of course, also the small, machine, the small firms mechanize more. And that's because now, finally, through the rental market, the low ability managers can access the machines. The low, low ability managers benefit more. And the reason, it's, it's twofold. They benefit relative. So these are the kind of distributional effects of the rental market. The low ability managers benefit more than the high ability managers for two reasons: that they are smaller, and so they're just further away from being able to buy the machine anyway, and also they have higher cost of capital because we discussed. I showed that there is a negative correlation between interest rate and and, and productivity. And so, look instead of what happens here on the right hand side. Effectively, the rental market eliminates the correlation between inter interest rate and mechanization that was very strong in the absence of the rental market. We, and this is the role of the rental market as a financial market. Even if you have a high interest rate, you can mechanize now because you, you can do it through the rental market before you couldn't do it. And again, through both forces, both the scale effect and the financial market effect, the firms that really gain the most are gonna be the relatively smaller firms. Okay, so I think uh, just uh, in one minute, let me just say we have additional results, but the key one that we show is that we already discussed this at length, is that the rental market works because it attenuates other frictions. The financial friction, financial market frictions that prevents firms from buying machines, output market frictions that prevent firms from growing by expanding and, and eating out other firms, and the labor market friction that prevents firms from growing by hiring more labor. And so we show that as these frictions are reduced, the importance of the rental market also reduces. So we conclude that the rental market is gonna be more relevant and more important in developing countries. So let me just leave you with one key message, I think, that, that about just in the interest of time about what have we learned here? I think there is, there is bigger picture, I think, than, than just the rental market. I wanna emphasize this, this bullet point, this, this bullet point um, here, the, the, first, the, the first lesson. And that's that, in this case, it was the rental market, but what we found is that in the, in the face of frictions that are preventing firms from growing, like labor market frictions, financial frictions, and, and demand frictions, firms were able in this context, in the carpentry sector in particular, to create a mechanism to go around these frictions and effectively to almost undo these frictions, to undo the indivisibility and, and undo some of these other frictions. And we saw that they go quite a long way in, in doing this through the rental market. And so I think this is kind of a more general point 
that whenever we you know whenever there is a friction we want to at least have a, you know we want to at least consider the possibility that 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 the market uh, in this case or it could be some other arrangement kind of is used by firms to 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 kind of undo some of these uh, these indivisibilities of frictions and and in doing that we show that firms actually go quite a long way in, in achieving kind of a productivity mechanization and so i think that's really the key uh, the key message of the paper uh, thanks a lot, uh, and thanks a lot for all the uh, great questions and, and, and feedback. And I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes, but let me just stop here in the interest of time. All right. So thank thanks. you so thank much, Mario. Amazing. Thanks. So what I'll do is I'll formally end the meeting, so just in case somebody is in a hurry to attend another meeting. But let's stick around and like you know, there, there are quite a few questions. I think Rod wants to ask one, and then there's Sean, and then I'll go. Yeah. So Rod, you want to go first? No, I, I didn't. I didn't plan to ask a question. Sorry, I was oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. cut off by a machine crash before and I missed the finance section. Um, so I'll have to read the paper to follow up on that rather than asking you to repeat something. Thanks for that. Sean? Okay, uh, thanks, Vittorio. Uh, so I have uh, uh, two questions. One is about the, um, so in the end, you try to match the model uh, to the data. Here, I, I feel that you just match the aggregate or average uh, information rather than the distribution of the, for example, the ownership of machine across firms, right? You do not uh, match in that uh, distribution. No, we don't. Yeah, so no, that's uh, I understand. So here, because in your model, you should just, the biggest or the most efficient firm should just buy all machines in every step. Is that right? Yep. Yes. Um, because there's no financial constraint, there's no other, uh, for example, space constraint. So, there's no need of a risk of diversification. So I think the most efficient one should buy all machines. And there's no competitive advantage in each step in your model. Okay, so that's great. So uh, now, how do we avoid that? We avoid, uh, so first of all, in the data, we never see firms, we see very rarely firms owning more than one machine of each type. So we don't see firms like accumulating capital uh, in the data. Now, why that doesn't happen? Uh, one way that we model it is going back to Tusha, the point I made before Tusha is that we think we model it like, like a highly, well, we allow for a convex cost of capacity utilization so that firms don't wanna use these machines at capacity. And so because of that, you basically just don't wanna, you know, you don't, you never buy more than one you don't want to exhaust all the hours of one machine. So that's one way in which we prevent like massive capital accumulation in one firm, which we just don't see in the data. Yeah, uh, but I'm just interested in the data. Do you really observe actually? So the ownership of the machines in different, uh, that is needed in different steps of the production actually yes. could be distributed in some uh, interesting way across, uh, uh, across firms. Because, for example, the simplest case is uh, two steps and the two firms. Both yeah. of them just decided to cooperate with each other. So one firm just buy machines for step one, and another firm just buy machines for step two, and then, then they can cooperate. Uh, that could happen yeah. also in the case there could be some comparative advantage in each step for different yeah. firm, right? Some, some steps, they have skilled workers to operate uh, the type, one, uh, type A machine, and another firm just is more skill in the yeah. type two machine, then they can just have this uh, division of uh, 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 pur uh, purchasing these uh, machines in different steps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking we could look at, I mean, we could look at that. We are staying away from that. Uh, in the model, the way to think about okay. the model is there is only one machine. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. only one step in the yeah, model. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand, yeah. No, okay. no, but, 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 but now that, yeah, yeah, but, but you're right. So some of these, it would be interesting to unpack a little more like, um, for example, what you're saying is, you know, one firm might own a few specific machines for some specific steps. Yeah. And and why do they choose to own some? So we're staying completely away from that for tractability. Yeah, that, but, but that, it would be interesting. Yeah, there are many conditions for this can happen. For example, the financial constraint for each firm, even though the most productive firm, they want to buy all machines, but they can't because they cannot afford it. And then, are the net, uh, then the less uh, productive uh, firm, they can still buy some machines if there are some financial constraints or just because so here, of the risk diversification, yeah. yeah. 
So, I mean, there is a cost of capital here that varies, um, but it, it does turn, you know, some firms are gonna have a low cost of capital. They could buy more machines than, we, ha we have to have this convex cost of capacity digitization to prevent firms from buying too many machines because we just don't see that in the data. But in principle, it, it, it could, uh, and you see something I haven't said that is related to this. We do see some evidence of some specialized, re specialized shops that just buy a lot of machines and rent them out and don't yeah. produce as carpenters. Yeah. Like, like a, that's like what, a, well, my so question, we, yeah, so yeah. We have some of those. So those are in the, especially in the more developed areas like Kampala, yeah. like, yeah. and we yeah. model that, we have them in the model, right? So I didn't yeah. talk about that, but yeah. we yeah. model that. So actually, so know. this observation is related to my second question is, so here, uh, what, what assumption about the market structure? So you, I remember you said that the uh, rental market is a, uh, competitive, but I think that is just from the uh, uh, renters' side, right? The renters are quite competitive because they are just uh, uh, all of them just want the same machine. But yeah. what about from the owners' side? It quite a, could be quite a monopoly. That means the renter can get some rents uh, from this uh, renting yeah. out the machines. We don't find much evidence of that. So we looked at a couple of different things. We look at uh, there is normally more than one machine owners in each area. So uh, so so you you know firms are able to go to different machine owners, and so that prevents already kind of monopoly pricing. We we even ask managers how they choose the price that they set, and they say, well, we look at what other firms charge. So there is this idea of you know uh, of uh, com some competition in the at least in the in the in the okay. rental market. And, uh, and we actually calculate how much money for, we calculate an internal rate of return for each machine through the rental market. So we, we know how, many, how much profits firms make okay. from the rental market and we can okay. see whether firms make very high profits and they don't seem to be making excess profits compared to the cost of capital in Uganda. And in yeah. particular, we don't see the profits are relative to the cost are higher. I can yeah. show you that. The, can you, or, from the data, can you see the entry of this uh... Uh, some shops, as you said, just specializing in renting activity only. Yeah, they we, do not. We, yeah, so we, I think that's one of the reasons that could be uh, uh, driving down this rent from yeah, the owner side. That's right. Uh, well, there's some of that, but but, but yeah, no, totally. But what, what uh, so that plays some role. But like one interesting graph I think that we have here is this, where for each machine type we compute this is the cost of the machine. And we compute how many years it takes to recover the cost by renting out based on revenues in the rental market. And you see that for the biggest machine, like the thickness planer, given the rental market price, it takes three years to recover the, the investment. So if, if the rental market was, monop if you had monopoly, what you would expect is that machines that have a high entry cost, like a thickness planer, because this is the more expensive one, they should generate a lot of profits. But they don't. In fact, if compared to the cost, like a small router or a jigsaw creates more profits because you can recover the cost in just a few months. So this is telling us that it doesn't, this is not consistent with monopoly, right? Because otherwise you would have the thickness planer be up here where you would recover the cost of the thickness plane in just a few months because you can charge a yeah. big price. Or everybody, you know, yeah, but yeah, but yeah. it's not that. It's not, so yeah, so yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is kind of yeah, part yeah, of the evidence yeah. for, for, yeah. Quite probably the entry cost of this, uh, this uh, mechanization service provision is quite low. Uh, it is low, yeah. Yeah, yeah we yeah. see some of these activities kind of coming in. So that for sure plays a role in, in creating competition. Absolutely. Yes. And yes. So one more comment. I think it, uh, so. Uh, it is a uh, you really make a uh, have some potential make of uh, some very big uh, uh, contribution to this uh, contractual cost. So you mentioned a little bit about it and it was related to the comments raised by Simon uh, at, uh, earlier of this uh, seminar that it is here, it seems to me there could be some other contractual uh, uh, frictions in, in capital, in labor. Uh, firms may face some financial constraint, uh, but they can circumstance uh, uh, just a, a circumvent about, uh, 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 and bypass these uh, contractual frictions uh, through this uh, through this market, even though there could be still some contractual frictions here, uh, so, so, because of yeah. this, uh, for example, the question I'm raising is just uh, whether the uh, owner of the machine provides service, because it, it, this kind of thing was uh, involved some risk and yeah, some yeah. responsibility between renter and the owner, and there's still some contractual cost there. Uh, yeah. But this so contractual actually, cost could be quite small so, compared to others. Yeah. So, Vidura, can me, I quickly quickly chime in on that point a bit that you know, uh, the recent literature 
again, going back to agriculture that Mark Rose's work and Andrew Foster are coming out with, is exactly yeah. what Sean is saying, that you know, sometimes what happens is labor is also lumpy. So you hire a new labor, but that person, you'll have to pay that person for the entire day rather than two or three hours of work that he might do. And when you buy these machines and you provide the service, which is an embodiment of capital and labor together. Yes. So these yes. rental markets are also a way of smoothing the labor market frictions, right? So indirectly, they, they, they yes. make it more flexible. Yeah. Right? No, that's so, a great so, point. So that's why th this is so the penultimate slide that you had about, you know, what are the different, way, different ways in which this rental market works? Oh, I, yeah, think, yeah. I think there that's might nice. be a couple of more points that you might want to add there. One being that it also makes a labor market more flexible. Um, then the other being, you know, it also yeah, makes the point. risk sharing, you know, it changes the yeah. risk sharing across firms. Yeah. And this can explain why they do not merge rather than exactly. just share yeah. these uh, uh, machines. No, that's a great point. Yeah. That's and also going point. back yeah. to what yeah. Sean said earlier about, uh, you know, the specialization at different steps. Right. I mean, if they have machines that, uh, that, are, that do different jobs, then, then I see that as an opportunity, right? Because there were a lot of questions about why do they not specialize? Perhaps they are specializing, but, you know, in each of these steps. Uh, so they don't specialize across steps, right? The, um, so every firm makes the same. Uh, let me show you that. There is very little specialization. Sorry, across, I missed that, uh, yeah. No, no, I, I, I actually it's here. So these are the steps, and this is the share of firms that engage in the steps. And yeah. yeah, designing and drawing are a little bit of a steps that few firms do, but these are really the core steps. And almost yeah. everybody does all the steps for like cutting, planning, thicknessing, edging. So there's little specialization uh, across steps. No, but I really like the point that you were making about uh, supervision and the cost and the risk and labor. I think there's more to be done here because we, in a, so I agree with you, there is some labor sharing going on and, and removal of some of the labor market friction by using the workers of this other firm to do the machine job. Mm -hmm. But also we know from the survey, the firms share workers more broadly uh, for even uh -huh. more, like if I get a big order, sometimes I call the workers of, of another firm to work for me for a few days, I pay them and then they go back. So there is some of that, we, we don't, we stay away from that here. But it would be so there is a lot of sharing on in many more ways than than we that the rental market is just one way right but but there is many other ways in which these firms sort of cooperate um and um yeah so i think yeah no absolutely yeah fascinating no. so yeah any more questions Thanks a lot. Any, pressing, yeah. any more pressing questions if not uh you know you can always write to vittorio his email is in the announcement um all right. Yeah, no, thank, awesome. thanks very much. And please do, yeah, if you have more comments or you'd like to talk more, just let me know. This is great. Thanks a lot. It's, it's, it's also, yeah, we, we are kind of, kind of rewriting the paper. So this is a great yeah. time to, to get more thoughts. Awesome. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank All right. you so much. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, Vittorio. Have a good night. Thank you. Yes. And have a good day. <laughs> good afternoon. Yeah. And uh, too, sure. If you want to shout more at some point, just send me an email and. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll write to you and, soon. Yeah. Yeah, okay. sure. Definitely. All righty, everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye.